Uh, a few weeks ago, I was up in the state of Ohio, and for the state of Ohio, I was teaching a class, a day-long class on death and dying. And this was particular to a group of people who uh, are or want to become licensed as nursing home administrators or assisted living administrators or memory care administrators. You might think it odd to have to teach class on death and dying since that's something that comes naturally to all of us and has since time began. But death is intensely personal and it has ripple effects throughout your staff and throughout the family of the one who's been lost, but also about the other residents. The other residents also grieve and their families. All of us, no matter what faith we have, or even if we do not have faith, wonder what's going to happen next. I've seen so many sincere, faith-filled Christians who have lived lives that were remarkable in their faith begin to doubt and fear as they draw close to death. I always assure them that's normal. Most of us will have those moments. Some of us will have them more than others. But I also assure them that God will not hold such things against us. He knows that for us, we know that death is a part of our community and part of our life and part of our existence. But for us, death is always the first time. We have a fascination with the afterlife because we dread death. It's the ending of all endings for us. As I said last week when we talked about life and death and faith on death row, that I'm going to miss me when I'm gone. Uh, I, I, I think about all the things that I like to do and I've said and, and all the problems I've gotten into and I'm going to miss those. Even though I know I'm not really going to miss them, I think people understand the phrase. It is, it's an end point. And any assurance that we can get that we will be conscious and happy after death, well, that'll get our attention. And so then a Christian will arrive and they will give you hope that after death, there will be joy. After death, you will live forever. But then they tell us something else. They start talking about hell. In some ways, we want there to be a hell for bad people. And we are the ones who think we should consult with God about who the bad people are and who should go there. We, we can all agree, and some of them, you know, those that have hurt others, ruined lives, destroyed the peace of entire nations or the planet. But none of us want there to be a hell for us. Although, some will sarcastically, playfully, whistling in the dark type, say, well, um, you know, I'm, I want to go to hell because that's where all my friends are, as if you're going to be able to see them and engage. Or others will say, well, I'm, you know, we're all going to go to hell and just take it over. Mm. That's probably not the smartest move either. But I have struggled, and I've struggled with the concept of our faith in God being good and the gospel being good news. As a boy, as a young man, it did not feel like good news to me. It was a burden. The number of rules, expectations, the drawn lines, the internecine fighting between Christian groups, it didn't feel like good news because I knew I could never catch up with the requirements for heaven. It did seem to be rather like if you've ever had a daughter, and you bought her a Barbie doll, when do you stop buying Barbie stuff? When does Barbie say, I have now enough? It felt like that way about religion, because you would, might think, all right, I did well. You know, I went to church on Sunday morning for Bible class, for worship, for the evening service. I went on Wednesday. Or if you're a Catholic, maybe you went to Mass every day that week. You said your prayers, now, now have I done enough? And then you'll find, well, no, we're supposed to also be so benevolent, so sharing. We're supposed to be hospitable. It seemed to keep moving. The rules seemed endless. And we were told time and time again, quoting Jesus out of context, few there be that find it. And then there was hell. We were told that everybody who did not go to our church was going there. Now, by the way, if you asked us directly as an outsider, do you guys believe you're the only ones going to heaven? We would 
lie by evasion. Now, we didn't believe it was lying because we were told it wasn't. We were told it was humility, but it wasn't. We would say things like, well, only God is the judge, and we're not the judge, and we just want to tell you what God requires of us, which is another way of saying, if you don't stick with us, boy, are you in trouble because we don't think you're going to make it past the judge. I can still remember, my wife and I were living in the southwest of Scotland, and uh, we were watching a documentary the BBC was doing on nomadic groups in northern Iran. And I know some of you are thinking, whoa, whoa, your guy's life is just so exciting. Yes, it is, but you know, don't you know, keep your jealousy in check. And there, there are tribes that only have contact with other tribes one time a year when they come together to sell the carpets they've made or the other goods that they've made. Other than that, they have zero contact with any other, even nomadic groups. They're never going to ever hear about Jesus. They're not going to meet a Christian. They're not going to hear about baptism or the like. They don't know what an Old or New Testament is and never will. And I can remember a beautiful little girl, probably 12 years old, working on the carpet. And that's going to be her life, making those knots and thinking, is she doomed forever because she met in here? Is this, does she have to burn and fall and be bound in black darkness for all of eternity because we didn't get to her. And whenever I brought this up to ministers, they said, yes, that burden is on us. We have to reach them all. Or, And I'm going, all right, now that's an, you, you just bought Barbie new clothes, basically. Or said she needs them because now you've, you've made us guilty. Uh, and we would even sing a song which was horrible. <laughs> it was horrible. The words are bad and the concept is bad. But worse was the tune, because nobody could get the timing right, which was called, You Never Mentioned Him to Me. And it was all about the guilt, about on the day of judgment, somebody's going to look at you right as they're about to ignite, and they're going to say, you never mentioned him to me. And this, you know, it broke my heart. I use a lot of humor, and I know that humor for some people can be inappropriate, especially in a sermon of the like. Humor is the only way I survived this. And humor is the only way I still survive what I go through, what you go through. Humor helps, by the way. I, I know that many of you who I love dearly are humor deprived. Um, you, you have H, HDS, humor de, deprived syndrome, um, because I know I'll put something humorous, and it is. It's, it's hilarious. It's gut busting funny on Facebook, and people will come in going, oh, well, you should take this for that. Or, oh, I don't think that's kind. And you're just going, okay, all right, go away. Um, first of all, I never correct you on your page, so stop it. But I want, I want to just ask, think about this. Think about that Iranian girl. And then ask yourself some hard questions. We're not going to answer all the questions today. This is the start of a series. And some of the questions that may come in via Slido... I may have to put off saying that will be answered in a future lesson. It is not me dodging it. It is that you, um, you don't eat an elephant with one bite. You have to lay this in there a little bit at a time. So questions. Does the Bible teach that death is the last chance you get? I know a lot of people will say yes, but let's just ask the question. Does the Bible say that God's love only reaches a tiny percentage of the people he made in his own image and after his own likeness. Would have God of love, who defines himself as love, be content with a plan that has what? 1% effect? Or if you're talking about everybody who has a warm, fuzzy feeling about Jesus at some time in their life, I'm making up numbers here, 20%? 30%, is that acceptable? Think of this. In America, those of you that are watching in, in Germany, we got Mexico down here. We've got Tanzania. Africa's already checked in. I haven't looked at others. But in America, it is the only nation in which I've lived where you have DTC uh, advertising, which means pharmaceuticals companies 
can advertise their goods directly to the customer, even though you can't get it without a prescription. You know, my life goal is to be as happy as people on these drug commercials. And they're dancing around, and they're just excited. They got peppy little songs. And then there's the name, and you have to go talk to your doctor. But then they read the side effects. One of the pills to help your bones grow stronger, a side effect is brittle bones. <laughs> this is not unusual with medications. There are medications for depression that can cause suicidal ideation and depression. Just be aware, nature is not neutral. Uh, what you put in your body will have a negative effect as well as a positive. So just be aware. What if one of the commercials came on with the dancing and the singing and said, the majority of people will benefit from the drug, but a lot of people will be hurt. If they said a lot of people, that would give you pause. Well, would they launch a drug that has a 99% failure rate, a 1% success rate? And would they say, we're launching this, even though, well, let's even bump up the numbers, a 60% failure rate. It's going to really hurt 60% of you. 40% of you, it'll help. And we're doing this because we love you. Would anybody buy that? I want to tell you right now, this is one of the main sticking issues in Christianity, is you go tell somebody God is a God of love, but if you don't accept it, this is what happens. We need to talk about hell. We need to talk about what the Bible says about it. We need to look at every verse that has anything to say, any word translated hell in any version. And we're going to do that. And it won't be as mind-numbing as you think, because there aren't as many as you think. But Gehenna, death, destruction, Sheol, we're going to look at all of those. And you might be surprised what we find. But these things have always troubled me. And so I decided I needed to have a look. I'm a data guy. I, science background, whatever it is, God wired me to ask the why and pull on the threads. And so I wanted to find three markers, three markers in the snow to keep me on the path. What did the earliest Christians believe about this? What does the Bible really say? Look at the words. Look at the context. Who wrote it? To whom did they write? And the third what has God shown us of himself in scripture and in nature? That's Romans 1. What did he teach us in scripture and in nature? And the result is this series of lessons. We will have to take it slowly, one step at a time, just like we did with the 11-part series we just finished. This, I don't believe, will be 11 parts. Also, we are not going to mirror it on, Sunday, uh, on Monday mornings doing the digest uh, I noticed a lot of you really like that, but also the numbers fell because they, they like the variety. So we're going back to the variety of that. So you have to come here for this. Let's, let's just start with this. Take a very deep breath and relax a little bit. The good news is better than you could have ever imagined. The good news is better than you've been told. The good news is better than you've been led to believe. The good news is, in a word, good. We, the Bible is soaked with this information. In fact, just going through a survey that I did, came up with 72, 73 passages that just soak it all in. We're going gonna, gonna to look at 21 today. Yes, we are. But uh, there's also going to be one of these in the series where we look more at history and we're not going to really be looking at more than one scripture. And so I'm ready for the emails coming. You don't use enough scripture. So just, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. It's all right. Uh, the Bible is soaked with the goodness of God. But we often skip it. Thinking that the love of God is limited only to those he has chosen. Only those who come up to a standard. And only during life. And at the end of life, he ceases to be a God of love. We think it's limited to a tiny minority chosen, if you're a Calvinist, for salvation before they were even born, and others for damnation before they were even born. And yet God is love. What does the Bible say about the grace and love of God? Let's fill our minds with this the rest of this morning. 
1 John 4 and verse 8. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. God does not love, in other words. God is love. Notice the words. He doesn't love is what he's saying because everybody loves sometimes. He is love. Love is not what motivates God in some instances and then not at others. All of his motivation is because of love. Preachers, if your standard preaching style is to yell, to accuse, and to frighten people, you are not reflecting God. You might think you are because you grab some verses and you think that's what you can do. No. If the people do not hear and feel the love of God, there's something wrong. And I will tell you right now, a lot of folk are only Christians because they fear the terror of God and they've never felt the love of God. That breaks his heart and mine. One of the most famous passages on love is obviously in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 3 through 4. And then we'll look at verse 8 again. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. Husbands and wives, listen up. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Never ends. There's not an end point for God's love. I want you to do something for your devotionals this week or if you've got a men's meeting or a women's Bible class or something like this, please do this. Just, you don't have to do the whole chapter. Just these verses, write it in your own handwriting if you can. If your hands just won't let you do that, um, you know, type it out. But every time the word love there, write God because God defines himself as love. In your own handwriting, there's a certain power to it. Whenever you read it, that God loves all things, hopes all things, endures all things, believes all things. God is not irritable or resentful. God is not arrogant or rude. God does not insist on his own way. And if you're thinking, oh, ho, 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 yes, he does. You know, in some ways you, you have a point. But in other ways, how many times did he say, come, let us reason together. If two or more of you agree about anything on earth, we will agree with you in heaven. How many times? And we don't ever really stress those. There's, there's more. I'm turning too many pages here. I'm getting excited. I know you paid for the whole bit, so we're going to do it. <laughs> Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 45. You've heard it said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. If you want to look like God's kid, like one of the family, you have to love your enemies, which means loving your enemies is a major trait of God. It's what he does. He loves his enemies. If you're on social media attacking people, you think you are doing so on behalf of God, stop it. We love our enemies because he loves his enemies. And by the way, right now, I want you to listen to little voices in your head. I don't normally want you to listen to them because they're sourced from all over. But right now, I want you to listen. Because right now, if what you're hearing is, but, 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 you have been trained to ignore the love of God. Think about it. If a minister stands up and says, we need as Christians to gather together and unite in our faith in Christ, and immediately the first thing you start thinking of are the obstacles to unification, then you have been trained to ignore the prayer of Jesus in John 17. We have been trained to ignore these passages because it gets even more powerful than what we've done so far. Acts 17 27 through 29. Now, I'm going to set it up, then I'm going to read it. Uh, keep it on up there. 
Paul is standing among pagans who do not know of Jesus and do not know of the God who is. They have surrounded themselves with philosophy, with logic, with didactic. They they understand reasoning and power and argument. And they, they really feel like they know everything they need to know about gods. So Paul looks at these pagans and says this. God is not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine image is like gold or silver or stone and an image made by human design and skill. The people of Athens were already children of God. They didn't know they were loved. They didn't know they had a loving father, but they did right then. Goes further. Genesis 12, verse 3. All of these passages you've heard before, but we've been trained not to hear parts of them and the the consequences of the phrase, where it takes us. Genesis 12, 3 to Abraham. All the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. All? That goes against what many of us have been told. That only few will find it. You'll find Jesus wasn't talking about heaven and hell in that passage, but we'll get to it. Only few may find some of the blessings and joys of God on this planet. But God is still a God of love. And he said, all the earth, all the people, all the people. What does all mean? All the people will be blessed through you. The people of God, listen carefully, are a conduit of grace. They are not a dead end. They're not a cul-de-sac. It's not like the grace of God hit us, but it didn't hit our neighbor. No, when it hits us, we show grace. We reflect that grace. Everywhere we go, no matter how difficult the people are, we show grace. In John chapter 12 and verse 32, Jesus said, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw, how many people does that say? All. All people to myself. The verb there, draw, is um, a particular word meaning to draw with effort. It is used commonly in Jesus' day for fishermen that are hauling nets full of fish out of the water. Now, one of the most dangerous occupations in America, and probably is elsewhere as well, is that of a commercial fisherman. Because of the conditions that they are in, the, the, the ease at which you can go overboard and get wrapped in a net, get injured by the cables going in and out. Whenever I watch video of them, which is not often, but I've seen enough to know, when they start pulling up the nets and the whole thing starts to tilt. If you've ever wondered why some of these have these big boom arms that come out, that's to balance the ship the best they can so they're not swamped. And Jesus is saying, it's effort. There will be effort involved, but I will draw all people. Luke 15, 4 through 7. I want to talk to you that think you're the one that he isn't drawing. Which of you, these are the words of Jesus, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one who's lost until he finds it. When he comes home, He calls his friends and neighbors saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Not a single sheep is expendable to God. He doesn't save the one and go, Well, the 99 didn't behave. Didn't stay in in the pasture. If If you've not been around sheep much, they never stay anywhere because they're just brainless. They really are. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> if you're a, a boy around sheep and can trick them into doing stuff because you can't. But as soon as you pull a sheep out of a pit, the first thing it does is turn around and go back in. You have to pull it out and somebody else block the pit or it will go back. Not once, not twice, but will continue to do so. It is so in, impressive to me that we are called sheep. And God says, I'm not going to let even one go. 
I want you to notice this because I've heard this preached and maybe this was just in my little corner of a Christian tribe, but they would say, you know, he comes out and gets you. Now God's hunting for you. You'd better return to him. And they would pray and ask you to come forward and repent. That's not what he says. The sheep didn't do anything. The sheep didn't return. He went and got it. Not a single sheep is expendable. By the way, the word used there for lost is apolumai, which is usually translated destroyed. It was destroyed until it was brought back to the fold. That's when it was undestroyed. That is a word because I just wordified it. It was destroyed. Now it is undestroyed. The parables of the lost son and the lost coin use the same word, apolomai, being destroyed at, or in their lostness and the deadness and then brought back into life. In other words, when God is in the picture, deadness and destruction is not the end of your story. And God is always in the picture. 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 4. God our Savior desires everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, let me just ask you a question. How efficient is God? How good is God at his job? If he desires everyone to come, how many people do you think will come? Now, we can talk about parables. And the parable of the dinner party where people weren't prepared to come and therefore there were consequences. But once again, was he talking there about hell? Or was he talking about the kingdom of earth here and now? We get them confused and we should not. But more on that, we'll get to all of them. And and I know people are panicked when you start taking away their help. But keep working. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slow in in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He's patient. The patience of God equals the salvation of humans. The only way we're getting in is patience. How about this? Romans 5, 18. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, that's the sin of Adam, so one man's act of righteousness, Christ, leads to justification and life for all. Now notice the word all there. It's twice. So what happened to mankind through Adam was inclusive. Are we correct? Did 1%, 5%, 20%, were they harmed because of Adam or was everybody harmed? Everybody, all. If what happened through Adam was inclusive, what happened to mankind through Christ was also inclusive. Life for all. 2 Corinthians 4 15. For the love of God urges us on because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. You know, nobody ever had to have faith in Adam or even have heard his story to have been affected by his sin. Do we understand that? That little Iranian girl had never heard of Adam. And she's my stand in for the majority of humans that have lived. Didn't need to know him. Didn't he need to hear his name. Didn't need to believe in him to be affected by him. It's the same with Christ. His love will reach all. He said so. In fact, John, the, the apostle whom Jesus loved in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not for our sins only. But for the sins of the whole world. How many sins did Jesus forgive? And this is the thing. I bring this up often around Easter to help, or Palm Sunday, just to kind of help get people's minds geared around that this is good news. I'll ask people how many, you know, who did Jesus forgive on the cross? And they'll always say, the thief on the cross. And I'll go, and? And they'll think for a while and they'll say, oh, those who are crucifying him. And? He said, forgive them for they know what they do. Was he only talking about people with hammers in their hands? No. It was a whole crowd. It was everybody. It was the other thief. 
If the other thief had known who Jesus was, do you think he would have made those comments? Of course not. Jesus doesn't turn to him and says, do you know who I am? No. He just says, forgive them. He is the atoning sacrifice, not only for our sins. So don't get too puffed up and prideful there, forgiven Christians. It's for the whole world. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 through 6. There is one God and mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. All people. Let me stress here. All of us understand there's one mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus, correct? Then why do we act like our church is the mediator too? That you've got to filter through our church to get to Jesus and then to God. There is one mediator. Not 30,000, 40,000, 100,000 denominations. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. God was reconciling the world into himself. That's a pooling to himself in Christ. Not counting people's sins against them. By the way, patience. The Bible does mention destruction, fire damnation it does and we're going to look at all of that some of you are already racing ahead thinking well this is it some kind of purgatory no purgatory is where you pay the penalty for your sins we don't pay the penalty for our sins that's been paid but there is something it it is far better to die as a christian than not but we'll get to it just don't be excited about it be excited about salvation and the goodness of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 28. When all things are subjected to him. Then the son will also be subjected to the one who put all things in subjection under him. So that God may be all in all. Now we're going to look at the verse also that says every knee shall bow. I was always taught that, that they were going to bow and tremble, tremble and fear. Knowing that they were going to be burning forever and ever and ever. That's not what it says here. They're put in subjection so that God can be in all and all. How many times does the word all have to be said before we pay attention to it? You know, uh, we normally, Christian denominations, uh, respect and emphasize baptism. We, they, we may do it in a variety of modalities and we may have different arguments, but baptism is understood. How many times is baptism mentioned? Not nearly as much as salvation for all. But we skip it because we've been trained not to see it. You can be trained not to see things. I think marriage is a good illustration of that. You, you don't need to look and, and try to find each other's faults. You don't need to look and find, uh, you know, saying, you know, you're picking up a little weight. You're starting to age there a bit. No, no, it's not safe. And it's not right. It's not loving. We're to be trained not to see some things. God God has given us a book full of all, all, all. God is love, saturated it in, and we've lost it. Not all our fault. We've been trained. Well, let's do some more. Um, I told him I might not do the full time today. It's going to be a little bit longer. Sorry. It's all these Bible things. First, um, uh, Ephesians 1, 9 through 10. He has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time all time, we always think that means our time on earth, no, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth, all things, things that aren't on the planet anymore, those will be gathered too. In Psalm 22, 28 through 30, as was read to us by Sharon today, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nation will bow down before him. For his dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nation's all the rich of the earth will feast and worship. Not just bow down. All of them will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. It's a beautiful passage once you understand what it's talking about. Romans 14, 11, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to the Lord. I know the old King James word says confess. But the word means to give praise to. If you've just been sentenced to an eternity of a torture pit, are you going to be praising? No, there's something better. 
Colossians 1, 16 through 20. I love this passage. It works with quantum physics too. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I love that phrase. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he may come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things. Whether on earth or in heaven. By making peace through the blood of the cross. Peace is not made by our perfection. Peace is made by his will and grace. Two more. 1 John 3 and verse 8. The son of God was revealed for this purpose. To destroy the works of the devil. Acts 3.21. Heaven must receive him. Until the times come for God to restore everything. Everything. As he promised long ago. Through his holy prophets. Our sovereign God has made it clear. He will save us through Christ. And restore all things. And all people to himself. But what about hell? What about judgment? We'll, We'll get there. We'll look at every single passage. And we'll understand why. Why is hell mentioned a lot more in the King James Version than it is in any other version? How did that come to be? Are people erasing hell? No. No. Are we saying that it doesn't benefit you to to be a, a Christian now? No, not at all. You want to meet God as a Christian. But you will meet God. And he is a God of love. My mother passed in November. Her parents were very, very strong Christians, but they were not a part of our church. They were a different church. And so my father had convinced my mother that her mom and dad were in hell forever. It took me a long time to convince her otherwise. And I didn't do that just to comfort my mother. I did it because I believe in the grace of God, and I believe him when he says, God is love. The question is, do we believe what he says? We'll talk more.